Do you ever feel like you're being watched? One couple certainly felt this paranoia when their dream family home, the place where they were supposed to feel safe and comforted, attracted the attention of a disturbed voyeur, turning their dream into a living nightmare. Hello and welcome back to the Little Shop of Crime, curators and purveyors of all things macabre and mysterious. And mysterious is certainly a word that can be used to describe today's case. Um, if I'm being completely honest with you, I do tend to gravitate more towards solved cases rather than unsolved cases, just because I feel like you get the, the closure and the answers and things that you don't necessarily get from unsolved cases. But every now and again, an unsolved case does come along that really gets you thinking and gets your juices flowing, if you know what I mean. I first heard of today's case probably about a year ago now, and it's just kind of stuck with me for some reason. Even to this day, I still find myself thinking about it every now and then. But before we get into it, I'd just like to let you know that I will be offering both solved and unsolved cases on a weekly basis. So if, like me, you have a fascination with true crime, please consider subscribing. Now, moving house. It's stressful at the best of times. But imagine trying to do it whilst you're being stalked by a deranged sociopath. This is the sinister case of 657 Boulevard. Today's case takes us to Westfield, New Jersey, which is located just 16 miles southwest and a 45 minute train ride from Manhattan. The affluent town of Westfield is home to 30,000 people and boasts a low crime rate, a close knit community and was once voted the 30th safest town to live in the entire United States. One of the most coveted neighbourhoods in Westfield is the Boulevard, a wide tree-lined street of opulent mansions. And 657 Boulevard was arguably the grandest home on the block. Built in 1905 and boasting 3,920 square feet, the six-bedroom, four-bathroom, Dutch colonial-style home sat at the end of a long, curved driveway. Its columned wraparound porch, large bay windows, and intricate masonry defining the stately property which was proudly surrounded by a well manicured lawn. And in June 2014 things were going well for the Broaders family. Derek had just celebrated his 40th birthday and had been promoted to senior vice president of an insurance company in the big city. And he and his wife Maria had just signed a large mortgage on 657 Boulevard. Their three kids were already debating which fireplace Santa Claus would use. This was to be their dream home, and the perfect place to raise their blossoming young family. Or so they thought. Three days after they purchased the house, at 10pm, Derek was just finishing painting his new walls, and he checked the mailbox before leaving. He pulled out a handful of envelopes, mostly bills and pamphlets, but there was also a handwritten envelope with no return address. Scrawled across the front in thick pen was, The New Owner. Dearest new neighbour at 657 Boulevard, allow me to welcome you to the neighbourhood. How did you end up here? Did 657 Boulevard call to you with its force within? 657 Boulevard has been the subject of my family for decades now, and as it approaches its 110th birthday, I have been put in charge of watching and waiting for its second coming. My grandfather watched the house in the 1920s, and my father watched in the 1960s. It is now my time. Do you know the history of the house? Do you know what lies within the walls of 657 Boulevard? Why are you here? I will find out. I see already that you have flooded 657 Boulevard with contractors so that you can destroy the house as it was supposed to be. Tsk, tsk, tsk. Bad move. You don't want to make 657 Boulevard unhappy. I asked the woods to bring me young blood, and it looks like they listened. You have children. I have seen them. So far, I think there are three that I have counted. Are there more on the way? 
do you need to fill the house with the young blood I requested? Better for me. Was your old house too small for the growing family? Or was it greed to bring me your children? Once I know their names, I will call to them and draw them to me. Who am I? There are hundreds and hundreds of cars that drive by 657 Boulevard each day. Maybe I am in one. Look at all the windows you can see from 657 Boulevard. Maybe I am in one. Look out any of the many windows in 657 Boulevard at all the people who stroll by each day. Maybe I am one. Welcome, my friends. Welcome. Let the party begin. The Watcher. Now, that's some sinister shit. Broadus's three children, aged 5, 8 and 10, had been playing in the yard of 657 in the preceding days, and it seemed the watcher noticed this, as well as the renovation work that they had started on the house. And they weren't happy. After reading the letter, Derek naturally panicked, ran back inside the house, locked the door behind himself and turned off all the lights so nobody could see within. And he called the Westfield Police Department. Shortly after, an officer arrived at the house and read the letter before looking at Derek and proclaiming, What the f*** is this? He asked Derek if he had any enemies and recommended moving any heavy renovation equipment from by the windows in case the voyeuristic letter writer decided to throw it at the glass. Derek rushed back to his family, who were all staying in their old house elsewhere in Westfield whilst renovation work was completed. And since the letter had made mention of the Woods family, who were the previous owners of the house, he decided to email them to ask if they had any idea who the Watcher might be. Andrea Woods replied the following morning, and it turned out that they had received an odd letter in the days before moving out. It too was signed, The Watcher, and apparently it also described how their house had been watched for many years. It was, however, the only such letter they had received in the 23 years they had lived inside 657 Boulevard, so they apparently just discarded it without giving it too much thought. But at the insistence of the Broadises, Andrea and her husband went with Maria to the police station to officially report both letters. Here they met with Detective Leonard Lugo, who advised that nobody mention the letters to anybody, particularly other residents of the boulevard, as they were now all suspects. He believed the Watcher to most likely be somebody who lived close to the house. The sinister letter naturally put the Broadus family on edge. Derek cancelled the work trip and Maria wouldn't let the children out of her sight and a few days after receiving it, they were invited to a barbecue across the street to welcome them and another new homeowner to the block. During the gathering, they scrutinised their new neighbours with suspicion, and when Derek gave a tour of the renovations to a couple who lived near the house, he was left aghast when the wife remarked, it'll be nice to have some young blood in the neighbourhood. Soon after, a contractor arrived at the property to discover that a heavy sign he had hammered into the ground had been ripped out, Despite their anxiety, renovations continued, and two weeks later the Broadises were yet to move in. Maria stopped by the house to look at paint samples, and she retrieved the mail. To her dismay, she noticed an all-too-familiar envelope. She didn't open the letter, but rather took it straight to the police department. Welcome again to your new home at 657 Boulevard. The workers have been busy and I have been watching you unload carfuls of your personal belongings. The dumpster is a nice touch. Have they found what is in the walls yet? In time they will. I am pleased to know your names now, and the names of the young blood you have brought to me. You certainly say their names often. 657 Boulevard is anxious for you to move in. It has been years and years since the young blood ruled the hallways of the house. Have you found all of the secrets it holds yet? Will the young blood play in the basement? Or are they too afraid to go down there alone? I would be very afraid if I were them. It is far away from the rest of the house. If you were upstairs, you would never hear them scream. Will they sleep in the attic? Or will you all sleep on the second floor? 
Who has the bedrooms facing the street? I'll know as soon as you move in. It will help me to know who is in which bedroom. Then I can plan better. All of the windows and doors in 657 Boulevard allow me to watch you and track you as you move through the house. Who am I? I am the Watcher, and have been in control of 657 Boulevard for the better part of two decades now. The Woods family turned it over to you. It was their time to move on, and they kindly sold it when I asked them to. I pass by many times a day. 657 Boulevard is my job, my life, my obsession. And now you are too, Broaders family. Welcome to the product of your greed. Greed is what brought the past three families to 657 Boulevard, and now it has brought you to me. The house is crying from all of the pain it is going through. You have changed it and made it so fancy. You are stealing its history. It cries for the past and what used to be in the time when I roamed its halls. The 1960s were a good time for 657 Boulevard, when I ran from room to room, imagining life with the rich occupants there. The house was full of life and young blood. Then it got old, and so did my father, but he kept watching until the day he died, and now I watch and wait for the day when the young blood will be mine again. 657 Boulevard is turning on me. It is coming after me. I don't understand why. What spell did you cast on it? It used to be my friend, and now it is my enemy. I am in charge of 657 Boulevard. It is not in charge of me. I will fend off its bad things and wait for it to become good again. It will not punish me. I will rise again. I will be patient and wait for this to pass, and for you to bring the young blood back to me. 657 Boulevard needs young blood. It needs you. Come back. Let the young blood play again like I once did. Let the young blood sleep in 657 Boulevard. Stop changing it and let it alone. Have a happy moving in day. You know I will be watching. Some of the letter has been removed to protect the identity of the broadest children, but it went into great detail about their birth order as well as the personal nicknames that Maria called them, proving the Watcher had indeed been listening very carefully. Perhaps the most shocking thing of all though was the writer asked whether the child using the easel was the artist of the family which really spooked Maria because the spot where the kid had been painting was within an enclosed porch only visible from right by the house. Now taking the matter a little more seriously, police began to perform surveillance on the house and Derek and Maria stopped allowing their children to visit entirely. And although they continued with renovations, the stress and worry were giving them second thoughts about ever moving in at all. A neighbour from 633 Boulevard came forward to say that they too had received a letter from the Watcher, but they were not overly concerned by it, and Derek and Maria were questioned about any enemies they might have, but none came to mind. The only suspicion they had was that the Watcher might be a disgruntled potential buyer who lost out. After all, 657 was a highly coveted home, and as soon as the Woods placed it on the market, a number of offers above asking price arrived. But the police were keen to turn their sights onto the Langford family, who lived right next door, and were known locally for being a little odd and reclusive. And one man in particular, Michael Langford, was high on the suspect list. He had lived there since the 1960s, and his father had died 12 years prior, which all corresponded with the letters. Not only that, but the Longford house afforded one of the only views of the porch where the easel was being used. Michael Langford had also been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and he was known to walk through backyards of the boulevard peering into windows. He was taken in for questioning, but vehemently denied being the Watcher, and those who knew him well thought of him as a strange but harmless character, incapable of writing such letters, and with no actual evidence, the police had no choice but to release Michael without charge. The Watcher's letters and envelopes were sent for forensic analysis, no fingerprints were uncovered, but a DNA sample was extracted from the adhesive of one of the envelopes. Whoever had sealed it was female. 
This drew police attention towards Michael Langford's sister Abby, who was a real estate agent. They thought she might be behind the letters after missing out on acquiring the property's listing herself. After covertly retrieving a water bottle from her work desk, they sent her DNA off for analysis. It was not a match. Mrs Woods also provided a DNA sample, but that didn't match either. Frustrated, Derek began to conduct his own investigation, to the point of becoming hugely obsessed. He set up multiple webcams and would spend entire nights crouched in the dark attic, peering from the house with binoculars, but the watcher never showed. He even resorted to hiring a private investigator to stake out the neighbourhood. The PI ran extensive background checks on the Langford family, but could only determine that they were really weird, and he was ultimately unable to unearth the watcher. Desperate, Derek turned to a former FBI agent and friend who, fun fact, had actually been the inspiration for the character of Clarice Sterling in The Silence of the Lambs. But you guessed it, nothing was discovered. Another FBI agent, a forensic linguist no less, carried out a threat assessment on the letters. He created a likely profile based on a number of factors, such as the erudite vocabulary, the double spaces between sentences, and the lack of profanity despite the apparent anger. He concluded that the writer was likely to be 50 to 60 years old, a keen reader, and, quote, not very macho. He also concluded that the author was unlikely to act on any threats, but did elicit signs of being erratic and unpredictable. The FBI agents suggested looking at former housekeepers or their descendants because the letters seemed to imply jealousy, which was possibly due to the fact that the Broadises had bought a house that their writer could not afford. But Derek was still certain that one of the Langfords was the Watcher. He obtained council plans and pored over them to see when each local family had moved in and which houses had views of his property's porch, as well as who would be able to hear his children playing. Only a few houses met both criteria, including the Langfords. Derek hatched a plan, and with police permission, he penned a letter explaining that he planned to demolish the house, and he sent it to the Langford family, hoping that it would spark a response, but he never got a reply. Perhaps the Langfords had nothing to do with it after all. I mean, it would be pretty reckless to write another letter after police had already questioned you. By now, Derek and Maria were becoming understandably paranoid and were eyeing everyone they passed in the street or the supermarket with suspicion. They even spent countless hours on search engines in an attempt to unearth locals that might be connected. And the police continued with the investigation, unearthing two child sex offenders who lived within a few blocks. And according to New York Magazine, a house painter hired by the Broadises one day noticed something very unusual. An older neighbour to the rear of 657 had erected deck chairs close to the boundary between the two properties. But instead of facing his own house, he positioned himself so he was facing 657, and he watched the workers as they continued to renovate. Police investigated, and it was discovered that his daughter had married a man who previously lived at 657, but the lead went nowhere. All former owners and residents of the house were also ruled out one by one. At 11pm one evening, police observed a car slow to a stop outside 657. The driver remained motionless before driving away. The car was traced to a female owner who resided in a nearby neighbourhood. When questioned, she insisted her boyfriend had been driving the car. It was also revealed that the boyfriend was known to play some very dark video games, and in one of them, he played as a character called The Watcher. He agreed to an interview, but didn't show up, so a second interview was scheduled. He didn't turn up to this one either, and with no evidence, they couldn't do anything. He had no legal obligation to assist police with their investigation. And by now, the investigation was grinding to a halt. There were no tangible leads, and the Watcher's identity was no closer to being revealed. Derek even resorted to having the house blessed by his priest. A few months after purchasing 657 Boulevard, the renovations were complete, but the thought of moving in with their children filled Maria and Derek with overwhelming anxiety. Derek considered purchasing trained German shepherds and even hiring military veterans to guard the property day and night. But living in a fortress was hardly the dream life they had envisaged in their new home. With their old house sold, the family moved in with Maria's parents, too afraid to put their children in harm's way. And with the extensive new mortgage, renovation costs and property taxes still being paid on a new house they felt unable to move into, Derek was suffering with insomnia and chronic depression, and Maria was diagnosed with PTSD, which her therapist said would remain unless they sold the house and moved on. 
so the Grand 657 Boulevard sat empty. Six months after purchasing the house, the Broadises put 657 Boulevard back on the market at $1.5 million, over $100,000 more than they paid. With the renovations and a booming real estate market, it should have been an easy sell, but suburban gossip had reached the local press, who were now showing an interest in The Watcher, and potential buyers were deterred. I mean, who would want to live in a house that came with its very own stalker? A further six months passed, and in June 2015, roughly one year after purchase, the Broadises filed a legal complaint against the Woods, on the basis that they never would have purchased the property had they known about the letter the Woods received. Their lawyer argued that they were unable to live in the home due to extreme anxiety and concern for the safety of their children. They hoped to reach a quiet settlement, but the Woods countersued for defamation, maintaining the letter did not appear threatening to them. The lawsuit sparked considerable media attention, and portions of the letters leaked, making the story of the Watcher explode. From someone who called themselves the Watcher. The Watcher. The Watcher. The Watcher. In the following weeks, the Broadises received over 300 media requests, ignoring all of them. But nevertheless, news trucks and reporters began to camp outside 657 Boulevard, whilst local residents were left living in fear. In an act of desperation, the Broadises applied to the Westfield Planning Board, asking for permission to destroy the house and divide it into two lots to sell, which would net them around $1 million. Local residents protested online, arguing that smaller homes would be out of character for the community and would require the destruction of a number of trees. Over 100 neighbours even turned up to protest the hearing, and the Planning Board unanimously rejected the plan a month later, citing that the two lots would fall two and a half feet short of the required minimum allotment size. To make matters worse, the civil lawsuit lodged by the Broadises was thrown out in October 2017. It was determined that the case could set an unreasonable precedent for what sellers would need to disclose to potential buyers. The Broadises decided the best option for now was to rent out 657. Their new tenants were made fully aware of the letters, and a special rental agreement was written, featuring a clause that gave them permission to vacate the house should another letter arrive from the Watcher. Their children were now adults, and they had two large dogs to protect them, so they agreed. And in February 2017, just a few weeks after moving in, a letter appeared in their mailbox. It had now been two years since the last letter from the Watcher. Violent winds and bitter cold, to the vile and spiteful Derek and his wench of a wife Maria. Where have you gone to? 657 Boulevard is missing you. 657 Boulevard survived your attempted assault and stood strong with its army of supporters barricading its gates. My soldiers of the Boulevard followed my orders to a T. They carried out their mission and saved the soul of 657 Boulevard with my orders. All hail the Watcher. You wonder who the Watcher is? Turn around, idiots. Maybe you even spoke to me. One of the so-called neighbours who has no idea who the Watcher could be. Or maybe you do know and are too scared to tell anyone. Good move. I walked by the news trucks when they took over my neighbourhood and mocked me. I watched as you watched from the dark house in an attempt to find me. Telescopes and binoculars are wonderful inventions. Maybe a car accident. Maybe a fire. Maybe something as simple as a mild illness that never seems to go away. That makes you feel sick day after day after day after day. Maybe the mysterious death of a pet. Loved ones suddenly die. Planes and cars and bicycles crash. Bones break. You are despised by the house. And the Watcher won. Police initially confiscated this letter and made it confidential. Forensic testing failed to retrieve any DNA or fingerprints. The tenants agreed to stay on, but asked for additional security measures to be installed, which Derek agreed to. But eventually, Derek put the house back on the market for the reduced price of $1.1 million. And by now, much of the local community was living in fear, but police insisted they had performed a thorough investigation, even though they were no closer to unearthing the Watcher's identity. 
One local woman speaking to a newspaper even suggested Derek himself could have sent the letters, theorising that the family might have got in over their heads with a substantial mortgage and were looking for a way to wriggle out of their financial troubles. Or even that it was all concocted by him for a potential television or movie deal. Maria Broadus took a DNA test to rule herself out as a suspect, and Derek vehemently denied being responsible for the letters. But in 2018 it was reported that Netflix had just won a fierce bidding war for rights to the story. By now the Broaduses were being openly mocked on social media, and people called them cowards for being scared away from their new home by a few letters. Defeated, on July 1st, 2019, Derek and Maria Broadus sold 657 Boulevard for $969,000. 400,000 less than they paid five years earlier, and not accounting for the significant cost of renovations, as well as the $100,000 in property taxes they had already paid. Despite everything that had happened, the family remained in Westfield and purchased a modest home in an undisclosed location. No more letters ever arrived, and to this day, the watcher's identity remains unknown. Thanks so much for watching. I'd love to know what you think about this case in the comments below. Would you have moved into the house? If you enjoyed this case, please give this video a like and even consider subscribing. Goodbye. Don't be a stranger.